welcome to Digest This, where we discuss day-to-day -day clinical issues in gastroenterology. My name is Francesca Moroni. I'm one of the gastroenterology trainees in the north of Scotland. Today, we are discussing iron deficiency anemia, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Gillian Bain, one of the gastroenterology consultants at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. Welcome, Gillian, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Francesca. It's a pleasure to be here. So iron deficiency anemia is a very common cause of referral both for inpatients and outpatients in gastroenterology. How do we define it and how common is it? So you're right Fran, it is very common. Um, it occurs be in between 2 and 5% of adult melanin and postmenopausal women and is said to account for between 4 and 13% of referrals to gastroenterology. The most common cause and why we as gastroenterologists are interested in it is because it's most commonly related to blood loss from the GI tract. But I think before we look at more about the causes of iron deficiency anemia, I think as you asked there, it's important to talk about how we define iron deficiency anemia first of all. So firstly, how do we define anemia? Well, that in men is a haemoglobin anything less than 13 and in non-pregnant women, a haemoglobin of less than 12. In order then to decide whether a patient has iron deficiency or anemia or another type of anemia, we then need to look at the rest of the full blood count and also check the patient's haematinics. So what we're looking for in the rest of the full blood count is the MCV, the mean cell volume, and the MCH, the mean cell haemoglobin. If both of those are low, so-called microcytosis or hypochromia, then that's in keeping with iron deficiency. You can, however, see a low MCV and a low MCH in patients with other causes for anemia, such as various haemoglobinopathies, such as thalassemia, or in some cases of anemia of chronic disease. So in patients with a disproportionately low MCV and those with the appropriate ethnic background, you may consider checking their haemoglobin electrophoresis um, to see whether they do have a haemoglobinopathy rather than pursuing further unnecessary, potentially, GI investigations. So that's first of all anemia and then looking at the MCV and their MCVH, but also you need to look at the haematinics. And a ferritin of less than 15 really confirms iron deficiency. But we need to remember that ferritin is also an acute phase protein and so can be raised in cases of inflammation as well. So sometimes you can get a falsely raised ferritin even though the patient is actually iron, does have actually iron deficiency anemia. And in those cases, checking a transferrin and a serum iron can be helpful as well. So what are the commonest causes of iron deficiency anemia? So the most common cause is blood loss from the GI tract. Before I go on to talk about those, there are some other causes as well, which I think it's important to mention. Sometimes uh, pe people can put um, an iron deficiency anemia down to a poor diet, but actually dietary deficiency um, in iron alone is a very uncommon cause of iron deficiency anemia. It's said that it takes at least eight years of a poor diet for someone to develop iron deficiency anemia. And so we need to be looking for other causes and not just putting it down to diet. Malabsorption is another cause of iron deficiency anemia and the most common causes of that are celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, previous gastrectomy and infection with Helicobacter pylori. But there are some other rarer causes of malabsorption that also contribute to iron deficiency anemia as well and they are mostly gut resection, bacterial overgrowth and actually in certain circumstances infection with things like schistosomiasis or hookworm, again only relevant in, in a small proportion of patients. So blood loss from the GI tract is the most common cause um, of iron deficiency anemia and the most important conditions to recognise are either gastric cancer or colorectal cancer. Other causes are gastric ulcers, treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, angiodysplasia, small bowel tumours, Cameron's ulcers and large hiatus hernias. So there are numerous different causes. As well as dietary deficiency, malabsorption and um, gut loss, there are other causes as well, including blood donation. Um, so it's important to ask patients if they do donate blood regularly. And also other rarer causes, including hematuria or epistaxis, so problems out with the GI tract. And so when we are referred a, a patients with iron deficiency anemia, what investigation should we request? So I think before we look at investigations, it's important, as usual, to take a good history and examine the patient. Um, and usually history should focus on 
whether they have any GI symptoms, including weight loss, particularly any PR bleeding or any other, you know, any history of melina. But also to look at whether they have any symptoms of that anemia. So are they breathless or, you know, how significant are, are, is the anemia and how, how impacted are they from that? But also um, to look at taking a dietary history and also a medication history as well, specifically with things we've mentioned about non-steroidals and anticoagulants. Not that anticoagulants necessarily will cause the anemia, but they can have implications for, for investigations. Next on to how we, met, how we examine a patient. So looking at simple things like whether they've got any skin signs of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, which is quite rare, but looking for that. Also to look for whether they've got dry skin, dry hair, um, problems with mouth ulceration or um, ulceration at the side of their, uh, their lips as well. And also to consider doing a rectal examination in those with a history of PR bleeding. Your analysis is really important as well. We mustn't forget that because up to 1% of patients with iron deficiency anemia will actually have a renal tract malignancy. And if we don't look for that, um, you know, at the get-go at the start, it can be forgotten about later on. And it's said that about a third of patients with renal cell carcinoma are, are anemic. So it's something that's important not to miss. As well as doing the, checking their history and examination, the next step in terms of testing would be that all patients should have celiac serology checked to check for celiac disease. Um, and with serology, um, usually tissue transglutaminase, but an, also an IgA as well, because we know there's a significant proportion of patients with celiac disease who are IgA deficient. In terms of more specifically on gastrointestinal investigation, what would you recommend being the first step and how we then progress on more in-depth investigations? So it's recommended that all adult men and postmenopausal women should have endoscopy and colonoscopy to investigate their iron deficiency anemia. Um, and ideally endoscopy and colonoscopy in the same session as preferred, um, it's um, less costly in terms of time and resources um, to do both procedures together. But in some patients who maybe have an endoscopy, first of all, um, the question is whether whether to take, one of the questions is whether we should take duodenal biopsies at the time or not. It's been shown that taking duodenal biopsies for all patients, even in those with negative celiac serology, is not cost effective. So we should only be taking duodenal biopsies in those patients who, one, have a positive celiac serology, or whose celiac serology hasn't been taken or checked, or the result isn't back yet. In patients who have an upper GI endoscopy as the first step before a colonoscopy, only a diagnosis of gastric cancer or celiac disease should stop you going on to do further investigation by colonoscopy. Having said that, patients with celiac disease are known to have a slightly higher risk of colorectal malignancy. And so even in the presence of celiac disease, colonoscopy should still be considered, particularly if the patient has a family history of colorectal cancer or they're over the age of 50 years. In terms of colonoscopy, it is obviously more sensitive than the other methods that we could use um, to look at the colon. Um, but obviously some patients um, don't agree to it or aren't fit. Um, and CT cologram would be the potential other option, but obviously that doesn't give you the mechanism to take biopsies or to remove polyps if they're identified. But it's said that it has about a sensitivity of greater than 90% for lesions greater than a centimetre. So it should pick up anything you know significant. We talk extensively about uh, adults, but I wonder if you wanted to comment on iron deficiency anemia in premenopausal women? Yes, what we've talked about mostly is investigations for men and postmenopausal women. And that's because menstruation is the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in premenopausal women. The only caveats to that would clearly be in patients who have had a hysterectomy or on certain contraceptives that mean that they don't have menstrual periods anymore. And if patients are not having menstrual periods, then they should be investigated just as for postmenopausal women. All premenopausal women should be screened for celiac disease. Um, and um, only inv investigations are reserved really for only those with symptoms. So if upper GI symptoms, then for example, going for endoscopy um, or colorectal symptoms to a colonoscopy. But in the absence of symptoms and with negative celiac serology, they, sh they do not require GI investigations. Unless 
Um, they have other risk factors. For example, if you've got a post a premenopausal woman who's over the age of 50 or has a history of colorectal cancer. Is there a role for small bowel capsule and diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia and when is appropriate to request a small bowel capsule? So first of all, I think it's not in all patients. Um, so if you've done an endoscopy and colonoscopy and haven't found anything significant, then the next step really should be um, to treat them with iron and to monitor the haemoglobin and really only to pursue further investigations if there is ongoing concern, particularly, for example, about a small bowel tumour, which is very rare, but, you know, if there's other symptoms or signs that make you concerned that that, that might be a possibility, then you would probably want to do a small bowel capsule or small bowel investigations at that stage. But in some patients who have an asymptomatic iron deficiency anemia, um, whose haemoglobin is maintained, uh, restored and then maintained on oral iron therapy, there's no indication to go ahead and do a small bowel capsule. You could consider doing other small bowel investigations such as an MRI or CT um, as well. But again, more looking if you're thinking about um, you know, a new diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. And again, generally that's where there's something else in the history or in the blood tests and raised inflammatory markers that's making you think more seriously about that being, being a possibility. But again, an asymptomatic person with iron deficiency anemia, small bowel capsule endoscopy wouldn't be recommended at this stage only if their haemoglobin wasn't maintained or restored. Um, so the diagnostic yield of capsule is reasonably high, about 50%. But even though you do have a positive finding on a capsule endoscopy, it doesn't always translate into a meaningful benefit for the patient. And so really it should only be um, done if they haven't um, responded to iron or you're suspicious that um, you're looking for something significant like a small bowel tumour. You briefly touch on uh, oral iron supplementation. So what is your recommendation to replace uh, iron deficiency in patients? So all patients with iron deficiency anemia um, should I obviously have treatment of the underlying cause if you've identified that at the time of your investigations. But over and above that, they should, yes, receive um, iron therapy. Now, ideally, that would be the recommendation initially would be for oral iron therapy in whatever form. Um, there are obviously a number of different oral preparations in terms of tablets. We do know, though, that our patients often struggle to tolerate um, oral iron preparations, particularly the tablets. Um, it's important to advise your patients on that and tell them that they will you know, probably get some side effects, but that... Um, over time they generally reduce and the side effects can be reduced by taking the medications with food so it's important that patients know that. If they fail to respond to or don't tolerate oral iron tablets um, then an alternative is a liquid preparation such as citron liquid and often that's better tolerated than the other forms of oral, uh, oral iron. But in patients who don't tolerate it um, then intravenous iron is an alternative. Um, and obviously, like with oral preparations, there are a number of different intravenous preparations and different um, uh, trusts will have their, their different preference for what they use. Blood transfusion should really only be reserved for those with a significant iron deficiency anemia and those at risk of cardiovascular problems or compromise as a result of a very profound anemia. But after their blood transfusion, they should always then be commenced on, on iron thereafter. So once we have treated our patients with iron supplements, how long do we continue these for and what should we do if anemia represents despite treatment? Well, ideally you should continue iron for at least three months after the haemoglobin and ferritin have normalised just to replen make sure that the stores have been fully replenished. And GPs should be instructed really to monitor their full blood count on a three monthly basis for the first year and then yearly thereafter or sooner if the patient develops symptoms of anemia again. Thereafter, if patients become anemic again, then um, they should be put back on iron and only at that stage, if their haemoglobin does not improve, is not restored or isn't maintained, then should be referred back. But otherwise, should just be continued on oral iron to, to keep their haemoglobin within the normal range. And that's what's recommended in the BSG guidelines. I think it would be important now if we could uh, have a think on special circumstances. As we know, we often overlook these. For example, an inflammatory bowel disease, iron deficiency anemia, is quite common. Would you like to discuss in details about it? 
So you're right, iron deficiency anemia in IBD is really common and it's actually the most common extraintestinal manifestation of inflammatory bowel disease. And I think a lot of the time it's not dismissed but not really recognised as such and actually it can have a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. So it is important to recognise and to treat because treating their iron deficiency anemia can actually significantly improve their quality of life and that's despite it having no, no impact on the disease activity itself. So it is important. As you know, many of our patients with inflammatory bowel disease don't tolerate oral iron preparations particularly well. And so it, you may well have to use intravenous iron more commonly in this group of patients. That being said, if you've got a patient whose clinical activity of the inflammatory bowel disease is low, you know, if they're in remission clinically from the inflammatory bowel disease, if they've got just a mild iron deficiency anemia, and if they've had treatment with oral iron preparations before and tolerated it, then that's the patients I would still try start on oral iron supplementation. If, however, they have evidence of ongoing disease activity, if they failed to tolerate oral iron preparations before, or if they um, have a really significant anemia with haemoglobin C of less than 10, then those are the patients I would be going straight for, for IV iron. Another special circumstance that we see more often now is patients that had uh, bariatric surgery. And so how do we treat iron deficiency anemia in this situation and how common is it? So there's obviously various different types of surgery um, for gastric bypass. Um, and the sleeve gastrectomy, for example, the outcome and the incidence of iron deficiency anemia in those patients isn't really known. But for all the other types of surgery, particularly the bilirubinopancreatic diversion with a duodenal switch, is um, definitely associated with iron deficiency anemia. And there are guidelines that exist for this and it is recommended that all patients that have these surgeries do have oral supplementation with iron, usually just once a day um, following their surgery. And in menstruating women, they should be prescribed the medication twice daily because we know that they already have a propensity to be iron deficient. And in patient, patient, these patients after surgery should have their full blood count monitored regularly at three, six, nine and 12 monthly after their surgery. How do you think we could improve uh, the pathway referrals from primary care to secondary care as per your experience and what is your suggestion? So in our experience we quite often get a number of referrals who, for patients who are anemic but not necessarily due to iron deficiency um, and often even simple tests like the haematinics haven't been performed to confirm that actually they are, are iron deficient. Um, we in NHS Grampian have developed a pathway for um, GPs. Um, it's available for them on our um, Grampian guidance, guidance network um, that helps them through what tests they should be doing, including their haematinics, what to look for, when, to, for example, to check their trans, uh, transferrin or their serum iron, and on when to refer and who to refer. I think in patients with iron deficiency anemia who have um, coexistent symptoms, upper GI symptoms or colorectal symptoms, the pathways are more defined for them, um, you know, urgent suspected cancer for colorectal or for upper GI, but for those with asymptomatic iron deficiency anemia, often it's less clear what the, what the GPs should be doing. So I think referral pathways can be helpful um, and um, certainly we've noticed an improvement in our, in our referrals since that pathway has been in existence. Well, only that is left for me to say is to thank you for an excellent run through a very relevant topic and to thank you for joining us for Digest This.